If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Praise God. Before we get into the Word and read that, I need to tell you about a few things. Uh, first of all, this lady who said her, uh, she gave her husband the silent treatment for an entire week. At the end of the week, he declared, hey, we're getting along pretty well lately. <laughs> There was this older couple, they were in bed one night saying goodnight, and uh, she said, after all these years, I found you to be tried and true. He said, I can't hear you, what'd you say? She said, after all these years, I have found you to be tried and true. He said, I can't hear you, what'd you say? She says, after all these years, I've found you to be tried and true. So he said, after all these years, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> there was a, a, one lady who was, it was her birthday, and on the morning of her birthday, uh, she told her husband, I just dreamed that you gave me a diamond necklace. What do you think it means? He said, maybe you'll find out tonight. That evening, the man came home with a, with a small package and gave it to his wife. And she ripped off the wrapping paper and inside she found a book that said, how to interpret your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> then there was this other guy who... who uh, came in for counseling and he said, my wife and I were happy for 20 years. And then we met. <laughs> <laughs> then there was this other guy who, uh, he was in the bathroom one day looking in the mirror and uh, his wife came in and, and he said to her, I'm, you know, I'm overweight. Uh, I've got, my, I've got bad posture. I've got, you know, wrinkles around my eyes and uh, my hair is bad. Could you say something that would just, you know, encourage me? Tell me something positive to help me during this time. And she thought about it for a moment and said, yeah, your eyesight is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what a compliment. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. I want to continue the series today, still going, energize your marriage, your marriage to last. Matthew 19 in verse 3, the Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And so I want to uh, come back to this phrase that Jesus made in the middle of this where he gave the reason why Moses permitted, not commanded, but permitted them to give a certificate of divorce and that was hardness of heart. Why would someone even think that way? Why would they consider someone they gave a lifetime promise and covenant uh, with that they would, they would leave them? Jesus said, this is how it happens. Hardness of heart sets in, and in that situation, you will be looking for an exit. So if I don't want to look for an exit or I want my marriage to last uh, for a lifetime, I must deal with the heart. I must deal with hardness. I must deal with stubbornness or an inability or an unwillingness to yield 
to the Holy Spirit, okay? We have all got to be adaptable and changeable, and I, I need to do that for myself. Of course, first and foremost, I'm responsible for my own heart, but then also, I want to be a contributor towards the well-being of my wife's heart, all right? Everyone who's married, not only do you need to keep yourself in a good position, you want to help them. Preferably, they help you too, but, I, but we're not here to, to focus on what someone else ought to do for us. I need to do this for me, and then I want to contribute toward my, my spouse's well-being and their heart condition. Because if my heart is hard, we're going to have trouble. If her heart is hard, we're going to have trouble. Okay? Uh, amen. Amen. So if we, if we know this is the issue, we know the enemy's strategy. He, we know how he's going to try to work towards us to get us to uh, harden towards one another. Now, in order for this to work, one of the key components is called understanding. Uh, husbands and wives need to understand each other. They need, let me say this, uh, say this clearly. I don't mean they need to understand God. I don't need, mean they need a revelation of who they are in Christ. Those are different things that are applicable to our lives and we need to know those. But I'm talking just the marriage. I don't have a good marriage just because I know God or he gives me revelation of his word. I'm going to have a good marriage because I know my wife. I have understanding regarding her. That's not necessarily a spiritual understanding. It's a natural understanding. I know the way she, I know what makes her tick. Okay, I need to know how she thinks, how, how she reacts to things. Okay, this should be the goal, should be the goal of all husbands and wives to know them. Now, there are certain things that are true about all men, certain things that are true about all women, and there's others that are not really that, that uniform. Okay, it's unique to them, it's unique to their life, and me prioritizing understanding is a huge advantage to me being able to keep my heart yielded and tender, and also my, my wife's heart in, in, in that, that condition. Here's what Peter wrote in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. He said, husbands, uh, likewise dwell with them, with your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife. So notice, understanding is honoring them. If I'm going to show honor to my wife, I must seek to understand. Someone said, well, that's a tall order, though. <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> but that would be honoring to understand, not just assume you know or assume they ought to be this way or they, they ought to think this way, but to seek to understand them. He goes on to say, as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be Hindered, so 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 consider that last point for just for a moment. That um, sometimes we think, well, my relationship with God is great. It's just my relationship with my spouse is not great. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's the case that your relationship with God is great while you're because according to this, if if you're not handling, if the husband isn't handling his wife correctly, treating her with understanding and honor and so forth, his prayers don't work. So it's not all good this way when it's bad this way. In fact, when this relationship is bad, it messes up this one. Praise the Lord. Well, I just love the Lord. I love to sing and praise God. I just love to worship him. And then, I, and then you go home and yell at your spouse. They might, I'm just saying they might be more connected than you think. Thank you, Lord. So, so then, uh, husbands, do, do you know what your wife wants? Do you know what she likes? Do you know what she needs? In other words, do you have understanding about her particular makeup and put place in life? Do you know what she wants? I mean, because if you don't, how could you ever seek to meet her needs? How could you ever seek to protect her heart if you don't really know in her specific situation, you know, what turns her crank? You know, what makes her go? And that's why relationship uh, for the believer in a marriage doesn't turn it 100% spiritual. Well, we just pray in tongues together. Well, 
That's probably not going to hurt you. <laughs> that's probably a good thing. But that's not the type of understanding that is needed in order for this relationship to be all that it's supposed to be. Okay? Amen. Now, one of the things that people often want and seek and sometimes will even say is, I just want to be happy. Maybe they've been very unhappy in life and they say, well, I just want to be happy. But I, I need to let you in on a, a secret regarding happiness. Seeking, pursuing, going after being happy is a sure way to be unhappy. It's opposite. I'm seeking, I just want to be happy. Because here's what happens is usually when we are seeking to be happy, we are wanting someone else to treat us in a certain manner. We want them to do things for us a certain way because we've interpreted if you will act this way, I will be happy. But it is putting pressure on or making demands on another person to fulfill our needs. That's the reverse of how happiness works. Okay, think about it this way. Uh, there are other principles that work this way, like, like faith. Someone said, I want to have stronger faith. I want to have more faith. How many know uh, you can have that, but you're not going to get that by, by asking God to give you stronger faith? Lord, increase my faith. He can't answer that question because faith doesn't come by praying. Romans 10 says faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word of God. The only way you're going to fix the faith problem is by getting yourself in the book and hearing God's word. That will produce your desired result, but not by going after it directly. I'm going after faith. Don't go after his word. Go after understanding revelation of God. Then faith will be the byproduct of doing that. It's like you don't pray for patience, right? There's certain things that don't come in the way that people want them to come. And if I want to be happy, I can't go after happiness. I need to go after what produces happy, happiness. Praise the Lord. Say, could you tell me what that is? That'd be, that'd be, yeah, it's called serving others. It's putting others first. In this case, it's finding what your, your spouse wants or needs and seeking with all your heart and sometimes time and money and effort to make them happy. And if you succeed, not only will you benefit them, it will backfire on you and happiness will mess you up. It'll get all over you. You'll wake up happy and go to bed happy. Seriously, it is the way of the kingdom of God. The way of the world is pursuing things for yourself. Me, me, me. Me, me, me. I want, I need. You need to do this for me. And it will have the reverse effect. Even if you get what you want, the activity, the thing, the, the, you know, the material thing, whatever it is, you get, get what you want, you will not be full of joy. Hallelujah. Now, let me, let's think about, about staying charged. Staying charged up like, the, like our illustration. Keeping your battery charged up. Like we all have phones and if your phone goes too low, you know there's trouble here. If you need to make some important calls or get some texts or something like that, it gets low, you're getting nervous if you're not around a charger. Because when it stops working, it stops working and nothing works. I wrote this down, okay? Because uh, this is like us, all right? When your battery is drained, you go into survival mode. All non-essential tasks are shut down. You become unconcerned about the needs of others because you have nothing to give. If your spouse is annoyed by you, who cares? You judge your present needs to be superior to their insignificant feelings. When we get that way, we're really that, not that enjoyable to be around. We don't contribute to anyone's well-being or the, you know, the, the, the conversation. And you don't want to be drained. But also, you don't want to be married to someone who's drained. It's hard in both situations. And so the goal then would be for us to stay charged personally. And then also to help our spouse stay charged. Now, you understand again, it's up for me to take care of me. 
It's up for my wife to take care of her. But because uh, I also love her, I'm, I want to make it easier for her. And likewise, she wants to make it easier for me to stay full, to stay charged, to, to stay um, in a place where we're not running on empty. And I don't even care about anyone else, what they're going through right now, because I got issues. Maybe you had a pain in your body before and it hurt so bad. It didn't really matter. You were unaware of, you know, two feet outside of you and beyond. It was gone. It's like, I don't have the ability to deal with anyone else's life right now because I'm in pain. Okay. So you, I think we understand what that means. Um, but then it goes to the question, what, what drains you? If you were a battery, what drains your battery? Let me say it this way. What drains your marital battery? What, uh, uh, at, at the same time, what, what charges you? What could, what could your spouse do or what have they done that causes you to be energized? You're, you're filled up. You're ready to go. Okay. Now, if you, if you know that or can recognize that, good. But let's flip it around where it's supposed to be. What about your spouse? What charges their battery? What makes them, what fills them up? What, what way could you talk to them or relate to them or act towards them that will make them come up? Because I, you know you like them better when they're full. You 100% like them better because they're nicer. They're a better person to be married to when they're full than when they're empty because they're not in survival mode. They're full of life. So what could you do to help them to be in that condition. And some of you will already know this, you know, if you think about it. Maybe it's when you give them a compliment. Maybe it's when uh, you do something for them that, that kind of charges them. Sometimes, ladies, sometimes, wives, you know sometimes what your man always wants. <laughs> See, <laughs> you want him to be charged up, show up naked with food. <laughs> well, it's either, it's either true or it's not, uh, but it's maybe doing, doing a favor for them. Maybe it's buying them a gift from time to time. It, it's not, that's not necessarily universal. That's, this is where understanding that person comes into play. And you know, whenever I do this, they get charged. Yeah, come on. Well, wisdom says, well, I don't, I don't want to be married to empty. Yeah, come on. To person on 2% battery. I want to be married to someone 90% up. So I know it's on them. It is their job to keep themselves charged up. But if you love them, don't you want to help? Amen. Don't you want to make it easier? Don't you want to hand them your, your extent, extended cord? Say, hey, you can plug in over here. Come on. You want to help them to be that person. And so you learn what they're all about. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now turn to Ephesians with me. Ephesians chapter 5. And I need to show you something that is so big in Ephesians. Many are familiar with Ephesians 5, the part of it that deals with marriage and that deals with marriage roles. But what's interesting to me is the verses right before Paul instructs them about husband and wife relationships and, and roles that they have. The verses before often get set aside as a different subject. And in one sense it is, but it's the setup to make everything else work. Okay, so look, Ephesians 5, 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another 
in the fear of God. Now listen, here's my message from this passage to, today is that before someone can be a good husband or a good wife, they first need to be a good person. Okay, and we would say, our language might be, before you can be an excellent, you know, godly Christian spouse, just be a godly person. Just be a good Christian. Okay, sometimes when, when people say or think or say, uh, I need marriage help. I want to say, no, you need Christian help. In other words, you're struggling so much to be a good husband or wife because you're a lousy Christian. Come on. And we don't, want to, we don't need to work on husband and wife stuff with you. We need to work on Christian stuff with you. In other words, the foundation for me being a godly, good husband is first having everything right between me and the Lord. I get that in place and I do basic Christian, uh, you know, life. Then I can tackle, if it needs tackled, the marriage role in the grace of God, not outside of it. With the Lord's help, not without it. Let me, let me uh, structureize those verses this way. I can see two things that he said right here that we need. Number one is I need to understand the will of God. So before I'm dealing with marriage stuff, me, a man of God, I, I need to seek to know the will of God for my life. What does it mean to be a man of God, a Christian? What does it mean to be a good person? What, what, what does that look like? Know the will of God. And then number two, he said, be filled with the Spirit. This is, this is the foundation. Why would I try to... Uh, uh, to tackle again any l problem in life as a believer without being full of the answer. Without being filled with the power, the, the, the Spirit of God that enables me to overcome. Why would I work in the flesh when I know the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God with whom all things are possible? Say, Lord, you're great. You're in my song. You're in the Bible, but I got real problems to deal with. <laughs> No, get over here and discover the will of God and get filled with the Spirit. Amen. What does being filled with the Spirit look like? Well, according to this passage, it means you're going to speak and sing by the Spirit. Yeah, that's talking about giving praise to God, right? We're, seek, we're speaking and singing in the Spirit. Secondly, he said, we're to give thanks always. So, say, I mean, I, I, I got marriage trouble. Have you given thanks to the Lord yet today? Have you sung any songs yet? You do that first. Then we'll talk about your marriage. And he said, and then submit to one another. Submit to who? One another. Who's he talking to here? Now watch. He's not speaking directly to husbands and wives. He's speaking to people. All people, married or not. Does submitting to one another apply to husbands, to, to regular people who are also a husband or a wife? Yes, yes it's the foundation. Say, well, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Are you, what about wife submitting to her husband? That's next. <laughs> this is first. Before you get to structure of one person is over another or the head and so forth in the marriage, First, we do basic Christianity, which is one another submission. I know the will of God. I stay filled with the Spirit. What is filled with the Spirit looks like? It means we're pliable. We're yielded. We give in to one another. There's humility that rules our life. Okay? It means we're not demanding our way. We submit to one another. Say, well, who's over who? Neither. It's called... Me, Brother Mark, and Brother Doug saying, hey, where, where do you want to go to lunch? Well, I want to go over here. Okay, let's go there. Well, no, I want to go where you want to go. And we have to get in a little argument. 
I'm not saying we're always this loving, but <laughs> ideally. It's called giving in. And you walk up to the door and someone grabs the door and the other person comes up behind them and says, no, you go. And you kind of argue about who gets to go first because everyone is trying to give in. Trying to submit to one another and say, your way, not my way. It's the opposite of selfishness. It produces joy. And this is before you get married. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah? yeah? That's why you really don't want to marry someone who's immature. Because they're going in saying, me, me, me. I'm marrying you so you can meet my needs. But someone who's filled with the Spirit, they know the will of God are filled with the Spirit. They're saying, you, you, you. What can I do for you? Again, that is prior to husbands love your wives and wives submit to your husbands. It's called just being a mature, godly, spirit-filled person. This is how relationships work. Amen. Amen. Uh, you mean... I know often people, when they have struggles in marriage, they want answers for the specific situation. We got problems, we fight about the money. We got issues with the kids. You know, we're dealing with this in our sex life. We're dealing with this. And, uh, and, and I would say all those are real and there can be answers to those. If, if I could convince most people to, to spend more time with God before they even address any of that and read the word and pray and worship and sing songs and give thanks and do that all the time throughout your life, stay full of the Spirit, so many of those other problems will go away. If they don't go away by themselves, when you do come together and deal with them, they go away so much easier. Okay? Praise the Lord. Look at verse 25, 22 then. Ephesians 5, 22. So after he says, submit to one another, then he addresses husbands and wives. Now he's done talking about people in general. Now he gets into the, the marriage relationship and we'll just go speedily through this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as, as to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let also wives be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish, or she should be. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And so this passage, which we could dive deep into, some want to dismiss or say, I don't know that we can do that. And here's the thing. You can do it if you know God's will and are filled with his spirit. Here's what I mean. A wife can submit to a less than perfect husband if she's filled with the spirit. A husband can love as Christ loved to an imper love an imperfect wife if he's filled with the Spirit. I'm saying that, that, that God in us enables us to do what is very difficult without him. And in some cases, impossible without him. Right? But when a person gets to a place where they start to entertain this thought, and they may even say, I, I just can't do this anymore. I, I can't keep going. I can't continue. Listen to me. Love can Love can continue. Love can deal with this. You in and of yourself, outside of the love of God and ability of the Holy Spirit, yeah, stinks. But in this, you can do it. I, I can do this. You remember 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7 reads this way from the NLT. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Yeah. I can't do that. Well, love can. And if I stay knowing the will of God, which is love, if I stay filled with the spirit, he's the spirit of love, then I can, by his grace, by his ability, handle things that I couldn't handle on my own, that I couldn't deal with before. When you yield to the spirit of God and, and the love of God, we are able to go. You are able to do so much more 
than before. You're able, in many situations, just to blow things off. You ever had times when the, the slightest thing irritated you to no end? I mean, the, just the, there she goes again. <laughs> now, there he goes again, always thinking about himself. Or there, you know, and we, we can just get angry. I tell you, when filled with the Spirit and knowing the will of God, they can act the same way. And you go, eh, I don't love that, but fine, whatever. It just doesn't get to you as much when you're full. Someone said, I have, I have real anger problems. Not when you're filled with the Spirit, you don't. You really don't. I have, I have you know, I'm insecure, but not when you're filled with the Spirit. I, I have a problem with lust. Well, not when you're filled with the Spirit. Say, so, yeah, Pastor, I speak in tongues. That, that's, not, that's not synonymous. When you're filled with the Spirit, think about it. Now, I know speaking in tongues is the initial response of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But uh, when you're filled with the Spirit, you're filled with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, you know, same thing, uh, kind, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, right? You're filled, with, that's, the more I'm filled with Him, uh, the more I am going to be producing those character traits in my life. Praise the Lord. And so, when you're filled, it's a lot easier to uh, keep small things small. It's amazing sometimes what, what, what blows up in a relationship it starts off so very small. And then we water it, we feed it, we think about it, we meditated on it until we're so frustrated and angry and it really wasn't that big a deal, but you let it grow. Instead of giving attention to other things, we let small things become major issues. And uh, not every issue needs therapy. Not every disagreement needs a family session where we gotta have a family meeting. Well, why? Someone ate the last piece of toast. <laughs> So <laughs> that was mine. A family meeting. Listen, that is not a life ending thing. You've heard of, you know, crying over spilt, spilt milk. If spilt is a word. <laughs> and we, and, but when you're filled with the spirit, perspective is different. It really is. We see things in a, in a toned down manner. It's like, yeah, we can, we can deal with this calmly, peacefully, cooperatively, cooperatively. Uh, I, I like to encourage people at times to be slow to correct others. Slow to, be slow to correct your spouse. Be slow to correct people in general. You know what I mean? Someone, or your, your spouse is telling a story and they get a detail wrong and you say, no, it's not like that, it's like this. It's like, who cares? No one else in the room cares about that detail and they don't know that it's wrong. Amen. <laughs> Instead of making them feel smaller, insignificant in front of everybody else, let it go right on past you. And you think, it wasn't five o'clock, it was six o'clock. <laughs> when you're filled with the Spirit, you say, who cares? <laughs> it makes no difference. I'm not going to embarrass them, right? Amy and I had some friends years ago, minister friends, and, and uh, we would often sometimes be at events where there's a bunch of ministers, we're all sitting around talking and everyone tells church stories and, you know, and, and, uh, and, and fun, some, a lot of funny stuff, but he would tell stories. He was this, our friend was a real talker and he would love to tell stories. And so he'd be uh, telling everyone a story. We're all listening and kind of entertained by what he's saying. And in the middle of it, his wife would jump in and say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not how it happened. Let me tell it. And it wasn't lighthearted. It made everyone in the room, you, you, we all felt it. Because he was just like, mm. <laughs> and he was embarrassed and he wasn't respected. And she, I'm, we're thinking, I'm thinking, I'll just speak for myself. Woman, <laughs> Would you leave him alone? That is, we don't care if he's wrong about a detail. And we don't know it. It doesn't wreck the story. 
but you make everyone uncomfortable when you treat him like that. And, uh, and their marriage didn't last. They're in ministry. They're pastors. They got divorced. Sad. And we like them. They're, they're, they're good people. And, and, uh, but little things like that sometimes become a problem. Amen? Hallelujah. You guys use up all my time. <laughs> or I prepare too much material, one of the two. Let me, let me end. Ephesians 5.33. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. It's kind of a summation. Love and respect. Love and respect. If we get our information about families and marriages and husbands and wives from television and movies, you're going to find they almost always get it 100% backwards. They'll make, usually the husband, the father in a, like a sitcom or something, he's always an idiot and he's always wrong. And at the end of the show, he always has to apologize because the wife and the kids are 100% right. Okay, think about the spirit that drives that. That's driving a message to people to, to, that is opposite of what God says in his word. And he'll mess up with the wife's role and the mother and she'll become something that she's not supposed to be. He'll become something he's not supposed to be. And, and we, that's where we get our entertainment. And we just, we just think, well, I'm just having fun. It's la I'm fu having fun, I'm laughing, and I'm enjoying this. Sometimes we're being taught too. And those attitudes get inside and they mess with our own lives, our own families, which are the most important thing. So let's get our wisdom from God. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to take uh, next week and answer, because this is a, shortened, a short series. It's not exhaustive. As you can see, we, could, <laughs> we can talk for a while. But uh, uh, and answer some of the questions that you guys sent in a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and then we'll, maybe Amy will help me with that. Yay. She knows all things <laughs> about relationships and marriage. And... Uh, <laughs> And so we'll have fun with that one uh, next time. Father, thank you for working in here today. Thank you for your hand upon us. Thank you for the Spirit of God working mightily in our midst. Lord, we love you. We serve you. We yield ourselves to you. Help each person, I pray. Help every married person to know their spouse, to let your love dominate them to stay filled up to the full, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with love and wisdom so that they can handle their, their, their challenges, their disagreements, handle them in a godly way, in a loving way. Help us to know our, our place, our roles, our function. Thank you, Lord. Most of all, we look to you. Everybody, would you pray this with me? And uh, I guess I'm primarily talking to married people, but uh, if it works for anyone else, then you can say it too. Say, say it with me. Say, Father, Father I'm, looking to you. I'm looking to you. You are where my help comes from. I yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I will not be a person with a hard heart. I, I soften today. I yield myself to you, to the Spirit of love. Help me to know your will, to walk in your ways, and to live a life filled with the Spirit. I will rejoice and give thanks and submit to one another. Thank you for helping me with 101, basics of being a good person and being a Christian. And from there, you helped me in my marriage. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.